Daniel didn't have it muted and had it. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to stand with us as we get started with some worship. Good morning, and welcome to worship with us today. We are grateful for the opportunity to be together. We hope that you had a very Merry Christmas. As you'll notice, things look a little different up front this morning. Conlon is enjoying time with his family back in Wisconsin, and we're grateful to Todd Epps and Amanda Bradas and Amelia Kerber for helping us out this morning and being here with us in worship. As a reminder, today is the fourth Sunday of the month. There is no children's church, but there is the nursery and preschool church happening regularly. And coming up this week on Wednesday, we will also have uh, No Salt and Light and children's program on Wednesday this week. We will continue our break for one more week before we start up again in January. So afterward, 
this morning, the chairs can stay down after the worship service. Will the ushers uh, come forward as we prepare to receive the offering? And before we do, I invite you to join me as we pray together. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the light of your word of Jesus, whom we've celebrated over these past weeks. And as we worship today, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us, with, with the reminder of your faithfulness in our lives and your presence with us at all times. May the light of Christ, which we've celebrated in this time of year, shine forth in our lives that we may recognize your glory and your beauty and be drawn closer to you as we worship. We ask that we would reflect Christ and love you and love one another as you have loved us, all through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand as we continue in worship together. Spirit 
lift the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not yield, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.
I lost. I said there would be 95 of you to here today. I lost. A couple of housekeeping notes. One, you will notice that Connie and me were back. Uh, Connie and I. Connie, Connie, Connie and Paul are back to wearing masks. Um, we are doing so. One, it's been a request uh, from our youngest son. We've got a grandson do uh, any day now he's now overdue and uh, uh, Aaron and Emma come to our house and they want us to be as careful because for some reason uh, Aaron wants to be in the hospital when his uh, baby is born and so we're doing that and we're also doing that because um, uh, Connie's father is dying uh, he's on a hospice care. We expect a phone call any day and anticipate we'll be making a trip to Ohio here very soon. So we would appreciate your prayers for that. It is that rhythm of life uh, that all people experience, but we in the Christian life uh, have that sense of, uh, of it in both death and life and the grace of God in both. Um, The second thing is uh, you are going to be, I hope you are going to be missing seeing Matthew Lorenzen on the platform. Uh, Matthew has left us, uh, gladly, joyfully left us to assume the uh, responsibilities of worship leader, uh, uh, staff position at the Upper Room Bible Church in Paxton. Uh, he is there day, today observing, and I believe his first official Sunday will be the first Sunday of January. And so uh, he would appreciate very much your prayers for him as he goes. And we are excited to see po- people go out from us uh, and uh, serving the Lord and being used of him's So pray for Matthew as uh, he takes up those responsibilities. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we have hope in Christ and that we do come to adore him because of who he is, because he is worthy of the adoration, because you have placed a song in our hearts, a song to our God and King, that uh, rises up within us a song of worship and praise and thanksgiving for grace and mercy, for the coming of Jesus, for the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension and prayer ministry of Jesus and the glorious hope of the return of Jesus. We pray now, we come here this morning a little bleary, from the weekend, but desiring that you would speak to us and longing to hear from you. We pray that you would, that you would animate your word by your spirit and that through the work of the spirit and the word of God, that we, the children of God, would hear from you and be made more and more like Jesus. Thank you that many of us can be with family. We pray that you would keep us healthy keep us safe, that we would indeed be able not only to have a sense of the presence of Christ here, but in our homes as well, we would ask in Jesus' name, amen. What do you do? What do you do the day after Christmas? I remember uh, sitting in a car in uh, Melder, Louisiana, under the carport of the home that my father had built uh, with his own hands and had raised his family. And I had locked the door and knew that that was the last time. There was no going back. My mother was dead. My father died. I still carry on my truck key ring, I still have that key, that house key. But I remember locking that door and thinking, this is it. 
I can never come back here again to this home as a home. Can you go home again? Can you return? Can you go back? I want to think about that a little bit out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2. If you will turn there, the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2. We heard uh, uh, this text read. Jessica read it uh, at our Christmas Eve service. If you've not listened to that or watched it, I would encourage you to do so. You can find it on our web page uh, can, I think you can find it on Facebook I think you can find it by googling it it's out there for people to see watch it um, but we're back in Luke chapter number two and I want to think about a group of men that did go back they returned and pick up a couple of principles uh, from their return and seek by the grace of God to apply them to us. Luke chapter 2, we'll begin in verse number 8, a familiar story. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. They were keeping watch over their flocks by night, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with great fear, as you can imagine. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news, the gospel of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Lots of those were around, but this baby is going to be lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. When the angels went away from them back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. They went with haste. And they found Mary, they found Joseph, and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, and they were glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all that they had seen as it had been told them. Just to set the context just a wee bit, this is, think about these concentric circles. This is a story that has a story that has a story. So there are these three concentric circles. There's the big story the Gospel of Luke, written by Dr. Luke. He's not named in the Gospel as the author, but we believe he is the author for a variety of reasons. Dr. Luke, who wanted to tell the story of Jesus, and he did so in two books. He did so in the Gospel of Luke, and he did so in the companion volume that he wrote that is called the book of Acts which is the story of the gospel that he describes happening, the gospel, the good news, which is the good news about Jesus, which is about Jesus having come, having lived, having died, having rose again, and having ascended to the Father. All of that reality contained in the good news. He told the good news, and he described in the gospel of Luke how it happened, why it happened. Then in the book of Acts, he takes up that theme, and he goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, the promises of God to make this happen, and he follows that through the prophets, and we see something of that uh, here in the story of the shepherds, that this good news, the angels are saying, of great joy, is for what people? Just the Jews, right? All the people, which goes back to the promises God made to Abraham, you're going to be the father of a blessing for what? All the world. 
And so the gospel was for everyone, and Luke tells that story, and then he describes in the book of Acts how this happens because the gospel first in the book of Acts comes to the Jews. And then God says, I got a plan. And that plan, <laughs> shockingly, involves a Pharisee of the... It is the day after Christmas. He is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Jew of the... Coming to the law, I kept all of it. And God says... He saves him and says, you Jew of the Jew, you man born of the tribe of Benjamin, you Pharisee of the Pharisees, I'm choosing you to go to the Gentiles. <laughs> oh my, what a shock, what a surprise how God works. And Paul goes and begins to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and the Jewish Christians are shocked because guess what? They begin to what? Believe the gospel, and it creates a mess. God doesn't mind. We think God doesn't like messes. It creates a mess, and God sees the mess, and he brings order out of the mess, but it's not that he doesn't love the mess because suddenly inside the church, there are Jews going to church with Gentiles. And before the Jews went to church with the Gentiles, how did they feel about the Gentiles? They what? They despised them. They were unclean, unclean. The Gentiles, unclean. And suddenly, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor master. We are what in Christ? We are one in Christ. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, brothers and sisters, that if they sat by you right now, you wouldn't have a clue what they were saying. Most of us. I don't speak Swahili but there are brothers and sisters that do. I don't even, I ain't even speaking good English. <laughs> but there are brothers and sisters that do. There are brothers and sisters that eat food I wouldn't touch. But they love Jesus, and God has saved them. And Paul, this, this man is met by Christ, and the gospel goes, and, and all of that to say, the book of Acts is about that. That's the big circle. Circle gets a little smaller here in Luke chapter number two because Luke describes this, how this gospel comes. It comes in the form at the beginning of a baby, the incarnation of Christ. So when Jessica is sitting up here, she's reading to all these children and she's telling them what we're doing here tonight is celebrating what God has promised through the ages and it started all the way back in the book of Genesis with the promise that God is going to bring one to crush the serpent, to be victorious, and he's going to be out of the loins of David, a king of kings and a lord of lords, somebody to sit on the throne of David forever and ever, that he is going to have no comeliness or beauty that we should desire him, that he's going to be the servant of servants out of the book of Isaiah, and he just brings that story forward and brings that story forward to one day Jesus is born. And Luke, that's the next circle that Luke begins to tell how that happened in surprising ways. He wasn't born in the palace. He was born as the king in a manger. It's a shocking story. It's a shocking story. We've heard it so much. We've lost the shock, but it's a shocking story how Jesus came. Born of a virgin, probably 15, 16. That's about the age girls got married in those days, 17 years old, poor, <laughs> Even after Jesus is born, they offer poor, a turtle dove as a sacrifice. They're poor. Joseph is a carpenter. They come out of Nazareth, and guess what? What comes out of Nazareth? No what? No good thing comes out of Nazareth, but the best thing does. So Luke tells that story. And then the circle gets a wee bit smaller, and that's where we're going to spend our time. This is the story of the shepherds. These men who have this amazing story, uh, who are often, um, I grew up hearing that these were not good men, that they often confused mine and thine. <laughs> and I, when I read that, I thought, what does that mean? And it means they were 
uh, my father would have said, sticky fingered. They were thieves and outcasts and unclean. But the more I read it and the more I read about it, I'm not sure that portrayal of the shepherds is accurate. After all, when you go through the Bible and begin to read, uh, Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, wrote. David, who was a... And ultimately, the Lord is a shepherd. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So I'm not sure that caricature of the shepherds as bad, dirty, um, uh, people is accurate, but the angel of the Lord comes, the glory of the Lord comes, and ultimately the story of the shepherds is not a story about the shepherds, it is a story about Jesus. And so maybe, maybe in the calling of these humble, hardworking men, God is telling us something about Jesus who is coming for and what he's going to be like as the good shepherd. Maybe it's more about Jesus than it is the shepherd. But three things happen to them, uh, and these three things are, are the common denominators for all believers, and then we want to think about two things that they do. So three things that happen to them, and then two things. Three things happen to them. Number one is the word of God comes to them. The word of the Lord comes to them. The Lord tells them something great's happened, tells it through this angel, and uh, they believe this word, and they go to see about what the Lord has done. But all of us, all of us, if we are believers, start there. The word of God comes to us. The gospel comes to us. I don't know how the gospel came to you. Some of you I do, actually, because you've told me. You've told all of us. Some of them came through, people seated in this room. Your mother told you the gospel shared the gospel with you, or your father, or your, both your parents taught you about Jesus. Some of you, it was pastors. Some of you, you, it was a television evangelist. Some of you picked, went to a hotel, opened the drawer, uh, and Bob, if you want to hear glorious um, stories, how that happens, talk to Bob, talk to some of these Gideons. They go, people go, they open the drawer, there is a Gideon Bible, and they read that Bible, and God speaks to them through his word, and they become believers. But at some point, in some place, in some historic setting, the gospel came to you. The word of the Lord came to you. It had to for you to be a believer. I don't know how it did in all the cases, but the uh, people become believers through contact with the gospel. So if we could do contact tracing, probably none of you have gone through that experience yet. Contact tracing tracing we could do contact tracing somewhere we're going to discover where you encountered the gospel how it came into your life and if you know that if you know how it came that should be one of the things that's on your your thanksgiving journal part of your thanksgiving journal should include how the gospel came against your life how you came into contact with the gospel. Because if you're giving thanks for that, what you're really giving thanks for is the grace and providence of God in sending that gospel to you. And so the word of the Lord came to these shepherds in a unique way. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, I'm coming. It's good news. You on Gelion, the good news of great joy. Jonah spoke about that at the Christmas Eve service. Go back and listen to it. It's the good news. It's the joyful good news. This is a good thing. Don't be afraid. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a liberator, a redeemer, a, a one who's going to buy you out of of slavery is going to purchase you is going to take you out of darkness is going to take you out from under condemnation who's going to forgive you all your sins is going to eliminate re get rid of the guilt uh, either the felt guilt or the real guilt uh, not all guilt is felt sometimes we don't feel the guilt that doesn't mean it's real all the real guilt he took it upon himself our substitute he came as a savior and he's christ which is another name for Messiah, the Lord. 
King of kings, the Lord of lords. Good news. And the shepherds heard this good news, and they believed it. They said, let's go see what? What the Lord has done. They believed it. So if the gospel has become a living reality in your life, if you're a believer today, if you're a Christian today, it's because the gospel came in contact with your life and you believed the gospel. You cast yourself upon the grace of God and his grace alone. You chose to commit to the gospel, to believe the gospel. Doesn't mean you understood everything about the gospel. There's mystery there. Doesn't mean you understood every theological premise. Doesn't believe you understood the hypostatic union of Christ. If you're confused about that, ask Jonah after the service. It doesn't mean that you understand all of the Trinitarian concepts of the Bible, but what you did understand is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible, the contact with the gospel tells me so. He died for me, he rose for me, he's coming to him for me my sins he forgave in Christ I'm trusting him for that casting myself upon that and then they went and they began to tell others about that they began that transform their life it changed their life it changes if any man be in Christ he is a new creation and so and their lives begin to demonstrate the reality of this transformation all of that happened to the shepherds And all of it, if you know Christ, has happened to you. Now, the two points. Think about it. you got to go with me. You're going to have to think with me just a wee bit here. Think about what the Bible says about them. I'm shocked. Verse 20. This surprises me. And the shepherds returned. Doesn't that just... Put your teeth on edge. Doesn't make you want to scratch your head and go, what? Doesn't that make you just like, I need to go home right now and think about that. And the shepherds returned. I just cannot get over that particular hump. Is that the best you can do? Well, think about what you have just experienced. Angels, Jesus, a virgin having a baby. Shouldn't you, shouldn't you go on the talk show circuit? Shouldn't somebody sign you up for a book deal? Shouldn't you be saying, we were first, we were first. Shouldn't, shouldn't you be doing something grandiose and great and amazing? Given what you have just experienced, the best you can do is go back with a bunch of smelly sheep to go back to oblivion, to just to anonymity where we don't even know these guys' names. They just kind of disappear off the map. They just, they return to go do what they were doing before. Isn't that amazing to you? Given what they just Experienced. You know, sometimes we can go back, mm, read the book of Ruth, Naomi, Bible trivia question. You will win it today if you play it and you can answer this question. Naomi returned from Moab. It's good. She went back. Sometimes you can go back. Sometimes you can't go back. Jesus went back, and he was not. A prophet is without what? Honor. He went back, and all they could say about him, isn't this Joseph's kid? What? Sometimes you shouldn't go back. Demas went back. He forsook the gospel and went back. Sometimes you should not go back. But these guys, shepherds, They go back to tending sheep. It reminds me of, I mentioned him a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of years ago. It's all run together. The Gadarene demoniac out of the Gospel of Mark. You remember that guy? We talked about him. He was just in his graveyard, and his life was, it was, you know, it was terrifying, and nobody can do a blessed thing with him. They try to tie him up. They try to get rid of him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Jesus comes, delivers him, 
And the scripture says, and they saw him seated in his right mind. And what does he want? He wants, I think, what the shepherd should ask for. He said what? Let me go. Man, can you imagine? I'll be the warm-up. Before you get onto the platform, I'll be the warm-up. I'll come on the platform, and I will say something like, you know, you're about to hear from Jesus of, of Nazareth, and it, the story is amazing. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how amazing the story is, and I'll travel with you, and I'll go around, and all these people will come. You will draw a much bigger crowd if you have the gathering demoniac out front first. We've all heard people say, well, if Jimmy Bob, Billy Bob, when I was growing up, it was Billy Bob. If Billy Bob can get saved, then the kingdom of God can really do something. <laughs> As if. <laughs> As if God needs Billy Bob to really do something. Well, gathering demoniac, we, if we can get the gathering demoniacs, think of all the churches, you know, uh, think of the uh, Christmas Eve crowd we could get. We're doing the Christmas Eve service featuring the gathering demoniac. And Jesus looks at him and says, go home. Tell people what I did for you. But just go home. And so what do the shepherds do? They go home. This year, as we face this year, and we wonder what great things, what amazing things is God going to do through us, let us not squander the opportunity of the shepherds. Most of our lives will be spent in the mundane. Washing clothes, chasing kids, driving semis, planting corn, teaching kindergartners, changing diapers. God calls us to honor him and to do his will and to serve him and those things. Two simple truths, and we'll be done. We'll be done early. Number one, don't miss what God has for you now by always pining away for something you do not have and may never have. We all have this idea. idea. It, can, it can be like an ear worm. It, it's an idea worm that can work its way into our thinking about the life that we may should have had, the life that was owed us, the life we should have had, and if we're not careful, the life that we should have had, and the way we think about it, and the way we perceive it, and the way we allow it to become part of our thinking can erode the calling that we have for the life that we do have. Let go of the life you wanted, maybe the life you think you deserve. And see what the Lord has for you now. God, the shepherds went back to being shepherds. One man has written this. Occasionally weep deeply over the life you hoped you would have. Grieve those losses. They come to you for a variety of ways. Because of the death of someone. Because of some bad choices. Because of somebody else's bad choices. I don't know. Grieve those losses, then wash your face. Trust God and embrace the life you have. Our future inheritance teaches us not to despair at what should have been, but to rejoice in what one day will be. Burn with zeal for good works, God's glory, and the service of others. Pray to the Father, read His Word, Obey and adore his son. Laugh and cry. Sing in hope. Look to Jesus and look for Jesus. See him around the next bend. Trust and follow Jesus now. Now you are standing the furthest you are ever going to stand from your eternal home. Don't substitute what you think your life should be for the life that God has ultimately called you to. I did Melba Walton's funeral last week. Yeah, last week. And um, her son-in-law, Alan, told me the story that Alan, who lives here in Gibson, and Melba lived here in Gibson, got called over to Melba's house and her 
sister was there and they were upset and Alan was sent to make them not upset. The reason they were upset is because the TV wouldn't work and there was something important they wanted to see on television and they just they were upset at the cable company, they were upset with the TV, they were upset with Alan for breathing, they were just upset. And so Alan got there and he said, okay, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to fix it, hand me the remote. And so they had this remote they'd just been banging around with and couldn't get it, so they handed it to him. It was the remote telephone. <laughs> it was the telephone. They had been trying and trying to get this TV to work by using the telephone. They kept pointing the telephone at the TV and it just wouldn't work. Don't substitute what God has called you to. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's taking care of sheep. Hallelujah. Don't allow social media and television and false dreams to rob you of what God has called you to. Principle number two, and I'm done. Don't denigrate the power and significance of the Lord in the mundane. One woman I was reading this week said, I'm the wife of a busy church planter. I'm a mother to three kids, four years old and under. We live in the Middle East. Sand gets everywhere. Under the door, through the windows, there's a gritty film everywhere. I spend my life wiping up sand. I do eight loads of laundry every week. My life consists of all things ordinary. The way I used to respond, and I'm asking the Lord to change me, is I used to think pity parties and anger was both necessary and acceptable in responding to my ordinary life. Paul Tripp has written this, if God does not rule your mundane life, then he does not rule your life because we all live in the mundane. <laughs> That's where life happens. Go back. You've seen this glorious transformative thing in your life. Talk to others about Jesus but go back to being shepherds. That's where God is glorified in your life. The unwasted life is living the life we receive from the Lord and living that life to his glory. I love what the apostle Paul has written. Make it your ambition. Now he's tapping into something. <laughs> Make it your ambition. Arrgh. To live what kind of lives? Quiet lives. Make it your ambition to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands so that you may live properly before outsiders. The shepherds went back to being shepherds after this glorious, amazing encounter with Christ. I'm not saying God may not call you to some great thing, but the truth of the matter is, the reality is, God calls us to live out a life that is often less than what we would expect, but in the dailiness of ordinariness, and it is in that place God is most glorified in our lives. Seekest great things for thyself. What does the prophet say? Seekest, I'm quoting the King James, so you're bound to get it. Seekest great things for thyself. Seek them not. Don't let the wise man glory in his wisdom. Are the rich man glory in his riches, the powerful man glory in his power, but let him that glorieth glory in what? This, that he knows me. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great shepherd 
of the sheep. Equip you with every good thing to do his will. Driving trucks, driving tractors, running a stamping machine, raising children, changing diapers, cooking food, washing dishes. That he may work in us in these things that which is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Would you stand with me? Glorious day, the day after Christmas.
Have a great week, everyone.